there's supposed to be some pictures showing up here before long. If there's not, then that's my memory trigger and it's gonna be a very short lesson. <laughs> we'll be out of here in 10 more minutes. Oh, they're up there. I must have turned this off when I... Appreciate everybody being here tonight. As you know, Tim Murray and I went to uh, Malawi and we had, <clears throat> we had trouble finding a time when we could make, make a report. But we think it's very important that, that you all know where the money that you give to the Lord goes and how it is spent. But this is about as soon as we could, with our schedules, work it in. I don't know how Tim has done what he's done. He's gone on another trip right now. He's been gone about as much as he's been here this summer. But we left on Thursday evening on May 27th, and we were gone on a 10-day trip. Uh, it's further than you think to get over there. Maybe that'll do it. I think uh, Jason used all the battery. <laughs> you got to turn that on. Thank you. It's good to have experts in the house. So, <clears throat> you might be wondering why in the world did we go on the other side of the world to Malawi? Well, we have tried, we were trying to diversify. We cut back some in Honduras. We'll look uh, more at that at the end of the lesson, but we were trying to diversify the mission efforts that we have, not have all, all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. And Tim was also trying to figure out where he could expand the child haven work. And he came across this country called Malawi. And he found out it's a third world country and there's a big need there for help with uh, the, home, the orphans, but he also, in investigating the work there, uh, came across Bear Valley Bible School in Equindini. And uh, this was very intriguing to us because in speaking to Ephron, the, the director corresponding with him, they were big on self-supporting preachers after they left that Bible school. Then they taught them uh, some farming techniques uh, emphasized the fact that they could support themselves after they left school, so they're not looking for support when they leave. Uh, Healing Hands International is supposed to come in and drill a well and help with that uh, farming or gardening effort for them. And so all this sounded really intriguing to us besides the fact that Bear Valley was involved, which uh, we had dealt with before vocational training is something we wanted to have in the school in Dan Lee and we're not able to get it done. Here's the other reason. This is our job as the Church of Christ, is it not? To take the gospel into the world. Jesus said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16 and verse 15. In Matthew he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. If we are not doing this job, nobody else is going to be doing this job. There will be a lot of people building hospitals and doing social work and other assorted works throughout the world, but if the Lord's church is not teaching the gospel, it's not going to get taught. And so going into Malawi looked like a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that. This is a picture of our mission field, if you will. And perhaps this one put it in more perspective for me because We, we left somewhere over here uh, in Arkansas and went down to Atlanta. And from down here, we flew all the way up here over into Europe, eight, eight and a half hours to Amsterdam. 
We left on a Thursday night. We got over here on a Friday morning. And uh, we flew all day long down here to uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, and spent the night uh, that night. The next morning on Saturday, we were supposed to leave from down here to fly up here to uh, Malawi by this little lake you can see here. And so we're not quite on the other side of the world, but it, it took a long time to get there. And for, for me from Newton County, that's a long ways from the house. The next morning on Saturday, <clears throat> well, this is uh, as we were down here, this was the Holiday Inn. We took this picture. We picked up Donnie Estes, Estep rather, Donnie Estep in Atlanta. Met him there and he traveled with us. He's been over there several times. He's the stateside director of the school over there and I'll have more to say about Donnie in a little bit. The next morning we got ready to leave and uh, go up here to this country called Malawi and they wouldn't let us leave, get on our plane Saturday morning because they didn't like our COVID test. So we had to stay another night in Johannesburg and uh, get another test done. Long story short, it, it worked out. Sunday then we're traveling. That was not planned and we we fly uh, three hours, we stop in Blantyre here, and then on up to Lalongwe, where Efren Vincent meets us in a car, and then we drive five hours up to Mzuzu, Mzuzu, and then on over to Equindini, which is right there. And we get there uh, Sunday night late. And so we left Thursday night, Thursday afternoon, and got there Sunday night. That was a little more than we planned. This is the picture of the beautiful airport in Lalongwe. And these are the two main characters in this report. Efren Imbano on the left and Donnie Estep on the right. If it wasn't for these two men, we probably wouldn't be doing what we were doing in Malawi. Efren Mbano is the stateside or the local director of the church or the preaching school there, the Bear Valley Bible Institute, and Donnie Estep is the stateside director. Efren is also one of the teachers. They call him Efren, they call him Mbano, along with Clergington, who is a co teacher with him. Efren's grandfather was. Uh, one of the first preachers in Africa to help the American missionaries. And he did work with Andrew Connolly when he made his tours through Africa many decades ago. And Efren is acquainted with many of the old, old preachers. His dad himself is not a faithful Christian, but his grandpa was a faithful preacher. And Efren has wanted to be a preacher of the gospel since he was a child. And he he is industrious, he's hardworking, he's fun-loving, he's organized, and he's a leader of men. I, I can't say enough good about him. And he has a great family, a beautiful wife, and, and they were a great hostess to us. Donnie Estep is a character himself. He's from West Virginia. He worked in the coal mines for 20 years, I believe, as an electrician. And the Pikeville, Kentucky eldership called him aside. He had been preaching on the weekends, and they said, we think you need to be, you need to be preaching the gospel all the time. And so they sent him to a Bear Valley school, which was then open in the Appalachian area. And Donnie Estep still lives in West Virginia at the foot of a mountain where they deal with black bear population all the time. But he goes to Africa twice a year when COVID's not going on. And he goes to Zambia, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and Malawi teaching short courses in the Bear Valley uh, preaching schools over there. So he makes personal sacrifices and financial sacrifices to be with the people he loves. Monday morning we were able to finally be on the ground and we were warned when we got there that we would need to speak at a devotional in the mornings. 
And this is a picture of the outside of the facility that they rent and they've got their sign up there. And uh, this is a picture of the classroom. They have 16 students right now. They range in age from 20 to 73. This, uh, this gentleman over here, there's a better picture of him later. He's 70, 73 years old. And it's really encouraging to me to be in a place like this where these people are on fire for the Lord and the Great Commission and are trying to better themselves, even at 73 years of age, to be better servants, be better teachers, and to be better preachers. Tim led the devotional on a Tuesday morning. This is a video that won't work, but I wanted you to hear the beautiful singing over there. The song leader will sing a line, if you will, and then the rest of the, the guys join in him and they, with him and they, they all sing together. And then they do the next verse. He sings a line and they all join in together. A beautiful harmony and bass voices. This is a picture of him. Imbano and Clergington. Clergington is the uh, one that teaches with him. They're both supported by Bear Valley. Uh, Efren gets $200 a month and Clergington uh, gets $150. These are the 16 students that go to school there, excluding Tim and Donnie and, and the, two, the two teachers. This is outside uh, the building. They go on four campaigns uh, a year. Last year, in 2020, during COVID, they baptized 100 people on the four campaigns that they went on. So that, when you hear those kinds of things, uh, makes you excited to be involved. This gentleman down here, that's the wrong picture. This was a 73-year-old uh, gentleman right here. And these guys were all very encouraging to us. They all wanted their picture taken with this, so I just threw a few of them in here. They, they wanted to be with us. This guy in the middle, I went out after the, after the devotional lines. I saw these, uh, I saw these pots cooking back in this building right over here. Then they were cooking with charcoal. And I said, who's the best cook back here? And, uh, this guy with the glasses, he spoke up. And he said, I'm the best cook. Well, come to find out, this is what they were cooking, Irish potatoes in a pot. And uh, they were glad to get them, cooking them on charcoal. So between uh, class and devotional time, this guy's getting his potato and this guy's eating his potato. They're getting their breakfast in and they're glad they're glad to get it. They do all their own cooking and they do all their own washing. And this is a compound. You can kind of see it laid out. It's laid out in a rectangle. The cooking and the washing's done in here. They live out here. This is a, another picture that gives you a little better idea of this facility that they are currently renting. After school that day, we went out to find the land that we had told that they had been given. And they, t they told us that the elders or the chiefs of the village had given them uh, about five acres. They didn't really say at the time how much it was so they could start building their building. Well, when Efren goes into one of these villages, he goes through all the proper social protocols and we go call on the elder or the chief one of the chiefs of the village. And of course that involves another picture. He's glad to see us and he sends us over to the land. We've walked up this hill and this land here is on your right. It doesn't look like much, but it is five acres and it is clearable. Most of this land here looks like this, gives you an idea of the terrain, it's full of brush. And in this picture, you can see the five acres that they've been given has been cleaned up a little bit. This picture behind these two guys, uh, the backdrop shows how they've been working on it. And they'll get busy when the school starts there. And the people there grow Irish potatoes and sweet potatoes. They grow peas. Uh, they grow a lot of corn. And they grow what we call peanuts. They call them ground nuts. 
but uh, those are some of the things they grow. And Ephron is very big on what he calls self-financing, self-support. And they can do that with one acre. They can feed themselves. Does that help? With one acre, they can feed themselves. And with three acres, then, they can take the extra two acres of produce and sell it to support themselves. This is a picture of our trip on the road to get into the land. There's another road coming in that the macadamia nut company is going to ensure is well done with a bridge. They're going to be neighbors to the school, and they are already farming all around Equindini, and we ate some of their produce. It's pretty good. But uh, this was the way we had to get in there. On the way back to town, we stopped at the chief elder's house. And uh, he was an interesting guy, this guy in the middle. We talked for quite a while, and I was really sleepy, and I was nodding off, and I guess I wasn't very subtle, and they started making fun of me. But I noticed on the wall that there was this headband hanging on the wall with a thing sticking out the front of it, made out of some kind of animal skin and fur. Well, when it came time to leave, we... Uh, went out in the front yard and he, to get his picture taken, he wanted that, that hat on. I guess that signifies that he is the chief of the village. And so he wore it for all the pictures. We just got an uh, email this past week uh, that he had gotten in contact with Ephron, thanking us for coming by his house and meeting with him and he has again assured them that when they begin building on that property, they will receive some more land. Uh, there's a sketch of the school they plan to build with classroom and, and uh, living space. There's Tim cutting up with Alice, their daughter. And this picture of uh, Ephron and his beautiful family. His wife is named Beauty. And uh, then there's the, the boy and, the, let's see, that's their son and this is their daughter Alice here and this is a niece that they're raising for one of their family members. This is a picture of the garden out in front of the property that they, uh, that they rent there in the front yard. And it's an important picture because it shows that they have been, they've been eating out of this garden all of this is gone and there's just a little produce left in the back. The rainy season's coming and it'll be time to plant again in October. But they, they grow those crops that I mentioned to you a while ago. But also here in the front yard, I saw this big hole right there in front of the garden. And I said, what's that all about, Efren? What happened? What's that? He said, well, that's, that's where I killed the black mamba snake in April. So this is in their front yard with the kids running around between the house and the garden. And they've had the, one of the most deadliest snakes in the world living there in their front yard. And I saw a picture of him holding it up. Efren's not real tall, but that, that thing was about shoulder height or higher on him as he held it up. One of the treats of living in uh, Malawi, I, I suppose. Before every meal, uh, you washed your hands. But this is the way you wash them, with a warm a pitcher of water and a basin to wash your hands in. Ephraim would be the one that, that washed, held the, the pitcher for everybody as we come in. This is in their dining room, and uh, one of the things that was a real shock to me was the, was the culture over there. I'm trying to think how to describe it. It was an overt, obvious submit, uh, female submission to the male gender. Now, this is her beauty's house, right? Well, she comes in and says to Ephron, dinner is ready. They fed us on Monday, lunch and supper, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Really good meals. So she'd come in and say, uh, the meal is ready, and he would tell us the meal is ready, and we would go in and go through this procedure. And uh, Beauty and Clergington's wife, Milliam, we would not see them. They 
we ate in the dining room, very nice meal with several dishes, and the women and the kids ate in the floor in the kitchen. Now that's different to me. I told them I probably wouldn't be sending Christy over there because she might not be good for their women. But when, when she would come in, she would, she would do this also uh, to, to talk to him. And when the children came in, they would come in and they would kneel on the floor to talk to their father. The, the respect for male leadership and elders in that country is much different than what it is in our country. This is a picture of Beauty and Milliam uh, working on some maize. One of the main staples over there is Encima. And it, it's about as heavy as Play-Doh. It's like grits on steroids, but it's kind of a paste or a powder. It's, it, this would be kind of a powder and they got it drying in the sun. But, but they, they can make patties out of it or uh, put it in a bowl where you dish it out like rice and that's how they use it like rice or potatoes. And it needs something on it so you can have some taste. We only had to eat that once. This is how the children are carried around by their mothers on, in a blanket on their back. There's another baby in tow and they're carrying those things on their head all the time. And I saw water splashing out of one of those. I can't imagine how heavy a mineral feeder would be that we use, one of those lick tubs full of water. But there was a lady carrying something about that size on her head with water splashing out the top of it. I don't know how, for one, she lifted it, and I don't know how she kept it on her, on her head without spilling it all out. While Tim was there, he did some work for Child Haven, and Child Haven, I think, paid for 25% of that trip. And they have five children now over there that they are uh, supporting and helping. They all, uh, we looked them up while we, they, we were there and they all got a backpack with some goodies inside and Tim met and visited with all of them on this trip as well. On Wednesday, we were invited to a lectureship in Equindini at the other, uh, one of the churches. There are two churches there. This is the Chinugu Church of Christ These are men giving their lectures, and the night, the day before, Ephron had said, we're going to a lectureship tomorrow, and you might want to be ready to say something while we're there. So I found out that at 10.30 I was supposed to speak. This is who put the lectureship on, the World Bible School. They have these gospel chariots you can see here uh, by World Bible School. And there were about six or seven men in, in suits that drove, drive these vans around, these trucks over the continent of Africa, uh, giving lectures and helping people. And they were running this lectureship at this church where uh, Ephron preaches twice a month. And so I was able to give a lesson that morning on uh, this Moses out of Acts chapter 7. At noon, it was time to break for lunch, and the cameras came out, and you can tell who the visitors are at these places when you go over there. So again, they want, they want pictures. These people were very friendly, very encouraging. The nickname of, of uh, Malawi is the Warm Heart of Africa, and the people there proved that to be true. These seem to be the two main uh, cogs, if you will, with World Bible School that were running the, the lectureship that day, and they were very friendly folks. Imsuzu is a, a sizable town 20 kilometers away to the uh, south and east of Equindini, and we went there for groceries uh, one day for beauty. And I suppose these open air markets are the same in most of these third world countries. And we ended up picking up some produce there. Everywhere you went 
in Equindinia, there was this meat hanging from the ceilings or the, the shed roofs of these uh, slaughterhouses or restaurants or whatever. But the thing that's unique about this one is Efren actually pulled in the parking lot so I could get a picture. But if you look down here, when, after you cut your meat off of this one, you can drop it right on the grill and start cooking it. But these were pretty plentiful as we drove through the streets and businesses like Ebenezer's Funeral Services. This country reminded me a lot of Honduras, except it didn't have many horses and mules going up and down the side of the road, but there were a lot of bicycles and foot traffic, and they know how to load a bicycle down and make good use of it. We were told when we, before we left, that we would have an opportunity one day to see some wildlife. And so we're staying here in Equindini and uh, Lake Malawi is the third largest lake on the whole continent of Africa. And it, it runs the whole length of, uh, of Malawi. Uh, from Equin Equindini, we, we drove up into the mountains and uh, came down to a lodge over here where we had lunch, about a two hour drive on the last day we were there. Efren thought it was important for us to see part of Africa besides just the the church work because there had been another gentleman there had been there for like two weeks and he didn't see anything was a little disappointed on the way up to the mountains we saw a typical roadside stand and as soon as we stopped to buy something they were right there at the window and I'm in the back seat there and I can smell not only the bananas but I can smell them too and as soon as we got the the bananas in the car uh, Tim thought, well, it's time to eat bananas. So he started to uh, peel a banana and eat, and then he found out that's not why we bought the bananas. Because as we got up in the mountains, these baboons were all over the place. And if you slow, slowed down, they would run alongside the car wanting you to feed them something. So there's a lot more baboon pictures than I dare share with you today, but this one stopped and looked at Tim and said, I think I, I remember you from somewhere. <laughs> but as we got on past the, the mountains and came down on the other side, we saw this lake, and there's a picture of it with the river running into it. It's a beautiful place where we were able to stop for lunch. There were dugout canoes, and then there was this, this fishing boat that they obviously still use with the net in it. The waves break on this lake like you were at the Gulf. And there's one of the locals who got one of the boats out paddling around in front of the lodge where we were. That's our dining room. And there's our lunch. This is typical for their lunches. You can see here with almost three-fourths of the meals, I'd say, that we were served, there were greens, like poke salad or spinach. They needed something on them. And this is a chombo, which came, comes out of the lake, and that's one of the staple meats for them in Malawi because the lake runs up and down the length of the country. And this is butterfish that also comes out of that that lake and so that was our lunch that day and we had a choice of encima or rice. And Bono ordered encima and he ate it with his hands because that's how you do it over there. That's the last day we're able to spend the over there <clears throat> and then Friday morning at four o'clock in the morning we were glad to uh, start heading back home. But the Friday, four o'clock in the morning was, was just a trip to La Long Way to get another COVID test so we could get prepared to travel on Saturday. And then we got home uh, Sunday evening and saw some of you here in the parking lot. We went over there to inspect a work that looked promising. And we met Donnie and we met Efren we met the students. We found out they're baptizing around 100 people a year. 
and uh, they're going to be able to do a lot of good work with our help. And the elders have decided to help build the school building there that they need. The bid that's been accepted is $45,000. We've been giving $1,000 a month initially to help with a budget shortfall they had, but they were setting it aside for something they thought they needed worse, and that was a building. Another donor has donated $5,000, so they've got $11,000 to start the project. They have a contractor picked out, and <clears throat> they need another $34,000 to complete this facility uh, on the land there for the school. I'm not, we're not asking for money because you all have been so generous that the money is there ready to be spent. This will enable Bear Valley to add one more class of 20 students. They would like to operate with a two-year program, a first-year class and a second-year class, but right now they only have room for 20 people. This will enable them to stop paying rent. It will enable them to start teaching hands-on farming so they can have some vocational training before they leave school, and it will also enable them to raise some of their own food and cut their expenses to operate the school. And so that's why we're in Malawi, to help Bear Valley Bible Institute have a facility to teach more people to preach the gospel. This is the mission field, and it's still our job to be taking the gospel to the whole world. Malawi is just one of the works that we are a part of at Hillcrest, and I thought it was important to, to show you where the money the Lord's money here goes. We're supporting three preachers in Honduras full-time, Luis David Arganyal, Neri Arias, and Oscar Morgan. They're preaching in four different churches. And we just know, now know, now you know what Bear Valley or what Malawi work that we're doing. We have a group this, this week in Mankato, Minnesota, where we help support full-time preacher Alan Cantrell. We also help support Jason Jackson at Christian Courier as he is now full-time with the Christian Courier. We write a monthly check to Christian Courier and Apologetic Express, the Miami Church of Christ for the Search TV program where Phil Sanders does a good job and that's going out all across the United States. We support uh, a young married couple from Cave Springs Church of Christ and they're now in Denver at the Bear Valley Bible Institute going to school. We support Green Valley Bible Camp, the work that goes on there, and we support Neosho Christian School and the Bible teaching that goes on there. And because of that work that I just listed, we have a physical presence in the states, in Minnesota. We have a physical presence here. We have a physical presence in Honduras. We have a physical presence now in Malawi. But we have a presence everywhere on this map through the Apologetics Press and Christian Courier websites. So what we want to do is continue to take the gospel to the whole world, and we feel that these are ways that can get that done, and Malawi is a new way that we can get that work done. As elders, we want to thank you for your generosity, and for your expectation that the monies that are given here on Sunday will be used to further the gospel of Christ. As elders, we know we'd be in trouble with this congregation if we didn't spend it for the Lord's work. And Tim and I would like to thank you personally for your prayers and support while we were on this journey. Tonight we want to offer the Lord's invitation The Lord's work is the greatest work that we can be involved in. Perhaps you are not a part of the Lord's work. You're not a part of the Lord's church. People in the New Testament became a part of the church. They were added to that number of saved people in Acts chapter 2 after they had believed, repented, and were baptized. The Lord added them to the church, the body of the saved, Acts 2 and verse 47. You can do that tonight. Perhaps as a Christian you have fallen away from Christ. You need to be restored back to Him. 
That can be done through repentance and prayer and confession of wrongdoing. If you need the Lord's invitation tonight, we would ask that you would come as we stand and as we sing this song.